I want to bring you a message tonight um, from uh, Philippians 2 and verse 14. But it's called, Learn to Break Before You Break. Uh, it's mainly uh, from this verse about complaining, arguing, dealing with it, what we can do to avoid it, and how to fix it. All tied in together. So we'll look at this verse before we pray. In Philippians 2, verse 14, it's Mama's favorite verse, where the Bible says, Do everything without complaining or arguing. Let's pray. Father, we are thankful uh, to be here, to be assembled together one more time this afternoon. Uh, to study your word together and sing praises to your name together. Um, help us to understand what we, what we studied this morning, that uh, we're part of your kingdom, and we're one big family, and that Christ is the head of, of the body, the church. So may we serve you with all of our hearts. May we strive to do everything without complaining or arguing so you'll be glorified uh, through us. We, we continue to pray your blessings on the, the church here at East Point. Uh, on all those mentioned on our prayer list, and we know Brother Phil, who loves you, he'd love to be here with us, and uh, instead he's at uh, hospital this afternoon, so we, we lift his needs up to you uh, with all the others. I thank you for your great patience and mercy with all of us. We pray it all in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. So, as we consider this verse from Philippians chapter 2 and verse 14, do everything without complaining or arguing, this verse should appear throughout the PowerPoint in several different slides. But I want you to consider these thoughts. The Bible teaches us one key principle of the Bible is Romans 3, verse 23, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That's a key Bible principle, is that uh, mankind in the beginning was born to be immortal, not to die, but because of sin... Uh, death came into the world. Death means separation. When you die, your, your soul is separated from your body. So the life is gone because your soul is your life. So when the life is gone, there's separation. Ultimately, separation and eternal death, destruction, is separation from God. And that's the second death. You're thrown into the lake of fire as we read about in Revelation. But... Uh, it's just key principles. We continue to go back. Sin, all of sin, sin causes death. Because the Bible says in the book of Ezekiel, the soul that sins shall surely die. Uh, so the soul that sins shall surely die. All of sin falls short of the glory of God. It means we're all going to die. Hebrews 9 verse 27. It's appointed once for a man to die and after this the judgment. And that's one of the problems. Just one of the problems with this uh, evolutionary idea that the world's billions of years old and dinosaurs lived on the planet back then all by themselves and they devoured one another. The Bible says there was no death until, no death of the animals until there was sin. That's just a key theological principle of Christianity. A uh, sin is a, a death rather is a result of sin. A uh, tremendous uh, presentation uh, by Brother Ryan Cox. He, he actually travels around at churches and he brings dinosaur bones and sets it up. It's a great thing at Hillsboro uh, that, that he brought in. We, I suppose we could have him here. He's from Oklahoma, so I don't know what it would be, how it would be possible to get him here. But a tremendous display about dinosaurs coexisting with humans. And do you know there are pictures of dinosaurs in almost... I'm getting off on a tangent. I apologize. But this is interesting. Uh... There are pictures of dinosaurs in most every culture, every ancient culture, that occur in things like pottery and artifacts that we found. And consequently, subsequent to those finds, we've, we've discovered dinosaur bones that fit almost verbatim exactly what is shown on pottery. Now the only logical explanation is those people saw those creatures and they drew them on the pottery. And that's consistent with what we see in the Bible. Uh, another point he brought out, the word dinosaur was not created until the 1800s. Uh, so where the, the Bible says a great creature like Leviathan and so forth, uh, in, if a translation was more common than 1600 James, King James Version, it, it would say dinosaur instead of Leviathan. So just food for thought. This is a key principle. All have sinned. Sin brings death. It's a key principle of Christianity and our worldview in so many ways. 
But remember, we're talking about complaining and arguing. You've got to remember that I'm not perfect. And you've got to remember that that guy or gal in the mirror looking back at you, he or she's not perfect either. And when we look at it, I'm not perfect and you're not perfect, so we'll just all be imperfect together. Then it helps us say, hey, we need to do things without complaining or arguing. Because we'll all just get along, you know. Um, key thought there, we've all sinned. Sin brings death. Isaiah the prophet says in beautiful chapter 53, says, all we, or we all, like sheep, have gone astray. Same idea. We're all guilty. We're all imperfect. We're all sinners. Now notice the Bible teaches us in Psalm 23, uh, I presume the most famous of all the Psalms, uh, the Lord, King David writes, the Lord is my shepherd. So the Lord is, is our shepherd. And that would make us sheep. And that's really an insult because sheep are known to be very ignorant animals. Uh, but yet the Lord is our shepherd. Among the things that he does for us, in verse 5 it says, uh, King David writes, You anoint my head with oil. You know why that they would anoint the heads of the sheep with oil? In large part it's because that uh, uh, the uh, sheep would fight. Especially when some of the females would come into heat and so forth. The males would show up and fight, just like most other animals. Um, and because of that, they would ram each other. And if they didn't have this oil on, same as uh, if you have oil on a boxing glove or something, or oil on your face, somebody's hitting you with a boxing glove, it'll slide off. It's the same idea. The Lord is my shepherd. He anoints my head with oils. There, there are going to be conflicts. And the Lord is going to take care of us and carry us through. But how much more we see that he, in the church, even in God's family, oh, there are going to be issues, there's going to be confrontations, there's going to be problems, there's going to be things we have to address. But the Lord is our shepherd. We're all part of one big family. I'm not perfect, you're not perfect, and we've got to get through it together. Just food for thought as we consider this verse. After all, it says, do everything without. Or complaining or arguing. That leads us to talk about stress. Stress is the leading cause of heart attacks, high blood pressure, hypertension, colitis, migraines, ulcers, diabetes, allergies, and indigestion. It leads to depression, mental breakdowns, and suicide. Stress comes from the Latin word strictus, which means uptight. Although they say that not, not all stress is bad, uh, it has been said uh, by some athletes that stress is the normal condition of winning. Just food for thought. Uh, one coach said that the, the runner who manages stress the best crosses the finish line first. I thought it was the fastest guy would <laughs> cross the finish line, but that was his food for thought. Um, in the race, especially in a sprint, you're stressed out the whole time as hard as you can go, and you've got to manage, you got to manage that situation. Out of control stress leads to distress. And I read about a, a, one of these guys that travel around and he, he speaks to groups of people and he's one of these uh, motivational speakers and he said he just held a meeting and he was surrounded by a group of people that had no problems at all whatsoever because he was talking to a guy in a personal setting and this guy was describing all the problems that he had in his life and these things just out of control. So he said, I just, I just was able to speak for a whole group of people. I was surrounded by people who didn't have any problems. And he said, well, that's tremendous. I would love to be part of a, a place like that. And the speaker said, well, uh, I was speaking in a cemetery. <laughs> you won't be surrounded by people got no problems and you're going to have to pass over this separation thing uh, from life to death and you won't have any more problems so long as you're uh, forgiven from your sins uh, by the blood of Jesus Christ. But until then, uh, as long as you're in the flesh, there are going to be problems in this world. That's what Jesus said before he suffered. In the most terrible fashions, he said in John 16, verse 33, Jesus said, In this world you will have trouble, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. But well, we always focus on that he's overcome. In fact, he has. Uh, but notice, he says, in this world you'll have trouble. As long as you're in the world, you'll have trouble. And that, that brings us to the problem of dealing with complaining and arguing. Now, one thing we could do, He's laughing a little. You think it's good to laugh? The Bible does say in Ecclesiastes 3 verse 4, there is a time to laugh, also a time to cry. 
But uh, in time for a lot of other stuff, you could write a song about that. Uh, but it says there is time to laugh. And a little humor at the right time can go a long way for the benefit uh, of, of taking care of something that could get out of hand uh, when you dress it with a little bit of humor. Uh, but we need to see that we don't laugh at God because nothing's impossible for God. Nothing. The Bible says, with God all things are possible, but here in Luke 1 verse 37, same idea in these words, nothing is impossible with God. Now, Sarah, the wife of Abraham, when, when the messengers from God, they said, this time next year your wife Sarah will have a child. Uh, she laughed. And that's what you don't do to God. You don't laugh at God because He tells the truth and nothing's impossible for Him. But the Bible says in Genesis 18, Sarah was afraid. And she lied about it when they confronted her. They said, you laughed. And she said, I did not laugh. But God's messenger said, uh, yes, you did laugh. She did laugh. But God got the last laugh because a year later she gave birth to the child of promise. His name was Isaac. So, and he's our spiritual granddaddy, uh, one of them. Um, the Bible says in Proverbs 26, like a madman shooting firebrands or deadly arrows is a man who deceives his neighbor and says, I was only joking. <laughs> Joke can be good. It can set the mood. It can take care of a tense situation for the better. But an inappropriate joke can do a lot of damage too. So there's a time for it, and it's not always a time for it. Uh, the Bible says in Ephesians 5 verse 4 about coarse joking. It says among the church, among the Christians, there should be no obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse joking, which are out of place. But sometimes it's good to laugh a little. Here on Wednesday night, I shared, uh, we're talking about a, a Luke 24, the road to Emmaus, uh, on Easter Sunday or Resurrection Sunday, uh, Jesus joined some men that were walking from Jerusalem to Emmaus, a distance of around about, I believe, seven miles. And uh, they, they didn't recognize Jesus until they got there and he vanished. And I, I shared with them, uh, I know a lot about a seven-mile walk. Because in the Smoky Mountains uh, just recently, uh, we signed up for what we thought we were going to was a 2.4-mile walk. That was 1.2 miles to this little waterfall and 1.2 mile back. That's exactly what it would have been if we had went to the correct starting location. <laughs> but we didn't. I go to the correct place, went to a different place, and we ended up walking what the Fitbit showed uh, from, from my little brother was eight miles. <clears throat> Carrying youngins and backpacks and uh, 111 flights of stairs the Fitbit showed one way. Woo! That'll bring you back. But sharing a little bit of humor, just like that. Uh, if somebody's done something, maybe a little silly. Well, let me tell you what I've done. I went to the wrong trailhead, walked a, a ton. I'm just now recovering from that, actually. <laughs> a little bit of joking can go a long way. When, when we have work day and stuff here, we had a good crowd yesterday. The building is sparkling clean. Uh, and I shared a little bit about that this morning. Everything went good. But when you're here, even on a hot day, uh, looking for a place that has some shade, which there was only a few of those, we still had fun. Guys joking, cutting up, uh, laughing together and working together, sweating together. Uh, it's fun time. Uh, laughing can go a long way for anger and, and problems. Uh, anybody complains or arguing or complaining or arguing comes up. Laughter could be some good medicine for it. Uh, another possibility is take things easy. Address any issues that come up promptly because after all this verse we're studying does say do everything without or complaining or arguing. So uh, address stuff that comes up. If you don't address it, it'll just fester. And the more it festers and the longer it goes, it's like in the book of Proverbs it says, without gossip a fire will die out. Um, but things that aren't addressed, a lot of times there's gossip that results of it and it just spreads and it's like gangrene that goes from one thing to the next thing and before you know it, it's out of control. If you address it directly, a lot of times you can cut it off at the pass. And remember when, when things come up, uh, the Bible does say clearly in James chapter 1, verse 19 and 20, Brothers, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. For man's anger does not bring about the righteous life that God desires. And uh, that's something we really got to remember. Uh, if you remember from over in the book of Genesis... Cain killed Abel. But before that happened, God spoke to Cain and he said, 
sin is crouching at your door. You know, that desire and that anger was inside. And God knew it and God addressed it. you got a decision to make. you got a choice. And you control your anger or you don't. Your anger will control you. And uh, that's something we all got to do. Um, one, of the, one of the sermons that was shared up at Hillsboro was a guy that he had a whole sermon about bless the Lord. The Bible talks many times about bless the Lord. That's something that occurs throughout the Bible and in the Old Testament, especially in the book of Psalms. And he said, when somebody pulls out in front of you, just say, bless the Lord. Just food for thought. Maybe that takes care of things, you know. Bless the Lord. Man's anger does not bring about the righteous life God desires. Furthermore, in Ephesians 4, the Bible says, in your anger, do not what? In your anger, don't sin. Um, Do not let the sun go down while you're still angry. That's very much comparable to what Jesus taught in the Sermon on the Mount, that if For the Jewish people, as they would offer sacrifices to God, Jesus said, as you're offering sacrifice, if you remember there that your brother has something against you, Jesus said, leave your gift on the altar and go first and be reconciled to your brother. That same idea of hurrying. Don't let the sun go down while you're still angry. Go first and be reconciled to your brother and then come back and offer your gift. It's like Jesus said clearly in that passage in the Sermon on the Mount. It's more important than worship is reconciliation with your brother. And the Bible says, clearly in 1 John, it says anybody who says, anybody who hates his brother who he has seen cannot love God who he has not seen. And the Bible ties that, God's Word ties that together. If we want to be forgiven, we've got to forgive others. And if, if we're going to love God who we haven't seen, we have to love our brothers who we have seen. That's another thing we got to do so we can work things out and do everything without complaining or arguing. Now, uh, in addition, as we look at this topic, complaining and arguing, we have to balance work and rest. Because actually the Bible commands both. When you look at it, the Bible says over in Genesis 2, God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it. Now that's before... That's before there was sin. Because they didn't eat the the tree of the knowledge of good and evil until Genesis 3. But in Genesis 2, verse 15, said God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. So work was not a consequence of sin. It was actually before sin. Food for thought. Um, The great... uh, The guy from... uh, Ozark Christian College... Don, what was his name? Don, Don DeWelt, that was his name. Yeah, he came every year to the uh, National Prayer Clinic years ago. And it was a brilliant mind, uh, tremendous on stuff on prayer and the Holy Spirit, a faithful man. And, but one suggestion he had, that about heaven, you know, we see on cartoons that you kind of lounge around on the clouds and play a harp all day. That's totally not in the Bible at all. One of the ideas that he presented was that in heaven... You get to work at what you enjoy. And after all, in Solomon, Solomon says in the book of Ecclesiastes, there's nothing better than for a man to enjoy his work. Um, So he had this idea that he presented, that in heaven, just his idea, take it or leave it, the Bible doesn't say that, uh, that you would get to do what you like to do. The tools never break. Nothing ever goes wrong. The truck never breaks down. That is heaven, ain't it? (laughs) Woo! Uh, everything just goes great and the weather's always perfect and you're in the presence of God surrounded by those who love God. It's, it's just that's paradise. So that, that's just food for thought. The man was created to work before the fall. Furthermore, the Bible says, even as Jesus taught in Matthew 21, in, in one of the teachings of Jesus there in that chapter, he said, go work today in the vineyard. And it's just this constant theme about working, about producing fruit, about doing your duties and your job. Uh, Now, the Bible, that's about work. It also talks about rest. In Genesis 2, by the seventh day, God finished the work He'd been doing, so on the seventh day, He rested from all His work. Now, let me ask you a question. Deep theological question, sort of. Did God need to rest? Did the all-powerful need that He was weak and He needed to recoup? 
I'm, I, I think not. That's, that's, my, that's my two cents on it. No. I think the all-powerful, he didn't need to rest. But he was setting a standard for us to follow. And there, it's proof that if you just work nonstop, you wear yourself out, you get nothing but fatigue from it. But if you have that rest, uh, you'll, you'll be more productive. You'll be better off. Um, God set that precedent when he rested from his work on the seventh day. And that, that is throughout Scripture, Psalm 62. My soul finds rest in God alone. Psalm 91, he who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. Jesus taught Matthew 11, come to me all you who are weary and burdened and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me for I am gentle and humble in heart and you shall find rest for your souls for my yoke is easy, my burden is light. Jesus taught Mark 6 because so many people, it says in Mark 6, because so many people were coming and going, they did not even have a chance to eat. Jesus said to them, Come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some. You know, we have to work, and there's work to do, and we've got plenty to do, and we should be busy doing God's work. But at the same time, we've got to realize the importance of rest. It, it's, it's important. Among that, um, we have to develop a relationship with the one over all and above all. We've got to develop a relationship with the one who brings peace if we want to do everything without complaining or arguing. And the whole idea, it's, it's tough for us because our anger is really invoked. When somebody does something wrong and they deserve it, it's what they've done. And why should I show them kindness and, and mercy? Because of what they've done to me. But if the Bible doesn't show us anything else, it shows us clearly what they had done wrong to Jesus. They had false witnesses that poured out lies against him. They, they spat upon him. They pounded him with their fist. Um, they, they knelt, after they beat him nearly to death, they nailed him to a tree. And the first thing he has to say when he gets uh, raised up on this cross is, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. If the Bible tells us nothing else, it tells us if we're going to be like God, we have to do good to those who do us wrong. If you want peace, if you want to do things without complaining or arguing, you take this idea, you're not perfect and I'm not perfect and we're all imperfect together. But we're all striving to be more like the perfect one. And that means we, we work together. Because the Bible paints us in 1 Timothy 3 verse 15, the church is God's household, the pillar and foundation of the truth. What does that mean? If the church is a household, it means we're one big family. And yeah, families have some fights. But family has a lot of love too. And imperfect as every family is, we put the fun and dysfunctional up the house. But we all work together. We all love each other. And uh, that's, that's the way it goes. We got to develop a relationship with the one who brings peace. The more Christ-like we are, the more we can handle every situation that comes up. Complaining or arguing, we deal with things, we pick it up, and we go on. And that's what I encourage you today. The Lord is our shepherd. And Psalm 23 verse 4 says, Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Now God's with us. Um, no matter what happens, no matter what bad diagnosis the doctor gives, Brother Phil was here this morning. He had chest pains evidently. He took some nitro. It didn't help. Because of that he went to the doctor and he's been admitted. Um... We don't know what each day holds. We don't know if there's going to be tomorrow. But we know who holds tomorrow for us. So long as we're in Christ. We develop this relationship. The Lord is my shepherd. If God is for us, Romans 8 verse 31, who could be against us? So what if destruction comes? We serve God. And what George Falls said up at Hillsborough Camp, I shared with you, he too is battling cancer. It's in his bones. He said... Uh, you can't scare me. You can't scare me with heaven. He's saying, I'm not afraid to die. He's lived, he's lived his whole life uh, preparing to die. What is there to be afraid of? It's God is for us. Who could be against us? That hope can be yours tonight, but only if you're in Christ. If you haven't obeyed Christ, you're not in Christ. And if you're not in Christ, you've got no hope. Well, only the eternal lake of fire that the Bible promises. There's nothing left but to fall into the hands of the living God. And it's a fearful thing. The Bible says, 
Hebrews chapter 12. So tonight, if you want to be in Christ, you've got to hear, believe, obey. Which means you change your heart, you repent of your sins, you confess Christ as Lord, and you're buried with Christ in baptism so you can be born again of the water and of the Spirit, raised to walk a new life.